I would uh, like to welcome you all to this session. My voice is deafening. Um, could we lower the volume? Excellent. I'd like to welcome you to this session of um, our task force on social cohesion, open societies, and economic transformation. Um, it's a particularly ambitious task force because it deals with matters that are very, very close to what makes life worth living and often but wrongly considered very far away of what the G7 should con consider. And therefore, we have a job of um, introducing a number of proposals. We have had a chance to interact and uh, talk with one another um, over uh, a period of time um, about uh, a really important matter, which is how to keep societies open and socially cohesive at the same time while enabling them to perform the transformation that we need to this inclusive, um, sustainable, and prosperous future. We've got um, a stellar group of speakers um, to start out with. Um, attending virtually is um, Henrietta Moore, who is founder and director of the Institute of Global Prosperity at University College. Hello, Henrietta. Delighted Hello. to have you here. And Henrietta, together with Franco Bruni and uh, myself, um, were led this uh, task force. And Henrietta will be presenting an issue brief from that the three of us wrote. Then there is um, also attending virtually Marike Blofield. Very pleased to see you. She is um, director. Um, at, uh, for the Institute of Latin American Studies at the GIGA Institute, the German Institute for Global and Area Studies. Uh, and great to have you here. And, uh, we um, have recently had uh, a very active um, and uh, creative session together. And so we know where we are coming from. Hopefully we'll be able to draw you into the debate. And then physically here um, on um, your extreme left um, is Lea Maria Löbel, who is a junior professional officer at the ILO, the International Labor Organization. Um, welcome. Uh, and uh, we are on my uh, immediate on your my immediate right um, left uh, from me from your angle is Hayo Lanz, who is the director of the Geneva office of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. And um, although we all come, oh, and I'm sorry, I'm Dennis Snower, um, running uh, Global Solutions um, together with uh, Anna Katharina Hornich organizing this uh, T7 summit. Although we come from very different walks of life, um, it is extraordinary the degree to which um, our thinking has converged. Uh, and um, I'm hoping very much that this will be a very interactive session. And so in order to promote interactivity, I would like to urge you all to um, keep the opening statements as short as you possibly can in order to allow us maximum time. Um, Henrietta, you will kick off um, with um, seven minutes um, for our issue paper, um, followed uh, by the other panelists who will each have um, five minutes each, and I will have uh, little compunction in interrupting um, if uh, to exceed the time limit for the purpose of uh, getting us to interact quickly. But it's very important to get these opening statements. So let's start with you, Henrietta. We are all here um, for your uh, pre presentation of our issue paper. Henrietta. Thank you, Dennis, and good afternoon, everyone. Lovely to see you all and a pleasure to be with you, if virtually. 
So in the task force, we were dealing really with what role can the G7 play in setting out new pathways for prosperity and sustainability for the G7 countries, the G20 and beyond. And we started with the new challenges we face, this need to address human and planetary well-being in a period of elevated economic inequality and political mistrust. And so the topics we discussed looked at that particular nexus and the difficulties we now face in addressing uh, those problems as they come together. And one of the dominant themes of the issue paper, which is what I will primarily talk about, is new forms of social protection. So that universal access to basic services for health and education has underpinned prosperity in the G7 countries. But a new basket of public goods is needed now, an expanded basket of public goods to meet these challenges of the 21st century. And these new public services should be focused on enhancing people's capacities, capabilities, and opportunities for economic and social participation, as well as also supporting the climate and energy transitions and leveraging the full potential of digital democracy. Now, the G7 nations have an opportunity here not only to lead, but to provide exemplars, that's experiments, if you like, for others to follow based on evidence. And to do that, those kinds of exemplars need to talk about how we can establish universal access to seven basic social protections as automatic and reciprocal entitlements of citizenship. And these seven are shelter, food, education, health and care, transport, information or digital services, and legal services. And these protections will not be needed or used by all citizens, but the assurance that they are accessible in the event of need will help establish greater so co social cohesion, a sense of belonging, renew the principles of citizenship on which the 21st century needs to depend. So what we suggested in the issue paper is that the G7 countries should commit to providing in the first instance, universal access to transport and digital services as part of the first steps in instituting a comprehensive set of um, these protection services or social protections that together will enhance productivity, increase social cohesion and safeguard citizens through the energy and climate transitions. We argued that conditionality should be eliminated or substantially reduced so that all taxpaying contributors are also protected. And this model of universal entitlement is necessary to establish the principles of reci reciprocity required for the expansion of these social protections. Now, as I just suggested, this need for enhanced social protection comes at a time of an equally urgent need to invest in adaptation and trans transition. And this is also a moment when countries have reduced fiscal capacity and coming now in the face of rising insecurity caused by cost of living increases. And the immediate risk here is that the G7 countries, all of us, will prioritize short-term political demands to address the cost of living. And in doing so, sacrifice their ability to make long-term investments those long-term investments being the ones that are necessary to improve planetary health and community and national well-being in the future. So a foundational rearrangement of advanced society economics is needed. The core economic performance of advanced societies can be sustained, but only with increased productivity from a much broader um, proportion of their populations. And the days of trickle-down economics, the elevation of the many by the outperformance of a few, is no longer possible because we can no longer exploit the global commons in the way we have been doing and use the mechanisms of financialization with which we're so familiar. Those escape routes are blocked. Now we can't financially compensate everyone for the coming adjustments and to make available the level of fiscal action to transition to a new productivity maximizing system under these conditions of transition, we need as I've said, to enhance the capabilities and capacities of every citizen to make sure that we can transition early and rapidly. 
Um, and so these current cost of living pressures are a dangerous moment because if we move to compensate in the immediate term and to make reductions in adaptation investments to pay for that compensation, this will result in steeper cost increases in the future and very likely increased disruptions. So a way forward has to be found now and quickly. G7 countries will need to better align <clears throat> their tax systems with these new social protections to create the reciprocity best necessary to support stronger social cohesion. And we've suggested in the issue paper, a combination of tax simplification and direct assignment of revenues from private taxes to universal protections. And recent work has shown that it is possible for a G7 country to fund higher levels of universal social protection and net zero commitments without increasing the burden on ordinary working people, thereby providing a progressive policy tool to facilitate transition. So we um, have suggested that a reconceptualization of social protection from a defensive and compensatory mechanism to a proactive foundation for our societies is necessary. And that this will require new frameworks and new measures moving away from GDP and aggregate figures towards finer grained, real-time, citizen-led and place-led metrics that link policy actions more directly to improve living conditions and quality of life and planetary health. And that in order to build trust, we will need to develop and recognize the importance of data and the digital, not only as part of the new productive platform of our countries going forward, and indeed all countries across the world, but to understand that we need to address issues here of um, empowerment, um, trust, agency, participation. And we've put forward a series of bold suggestions around the digital participation, and I'm sure that we can get onto those in the um, discussion, at least I hope so. So Dennis, that is my initial opening statement. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, Henrietta. That was um, puts it uh, before you, and I think that is an opening statement uh, in many senses. First of all, it lays out the size of the challenge, and it lays out uh, a number of important recommendations to meet that challenge. Um, I think we all understand that we are living in the midst of a true revolution, um, a technological revolution. Um, the digital age is reconfiguring how we, uh, how we conduct our lives. And now also more recently a geopolitical revolution um, that is making us keenly aware about issues of resilience and robustness um, of um, our economies and uh, ways of life. And therefore the need to rethink uh, welfare states, um, uh, rethink uh, how we organize our lives uh, in connection with um, our economic, social and um, political activities becomes really important. And what Henrietta has um, outlined is this sense of positive liberties, that you have to have the, the capacity to do things, not just negative liberties, the freedom to do whatever you like within your constrained circumstances, but the capacity um, to do important things and thereby gain access not only to levers of prosperity, but also to a sense of empowerment um, and an ability to participate in society in ways that you otherwise wouldn't have. So I think um, this uh, is a good framework uh, within which uh, the rest of us um, can operate. I'd now like to turn to you, Marike, for your five minute statement. <laughs> Marike has just fled. Um, <laughs> nope, she's back. <clears throat> Uh, we can't hear you at the moment. Um, if you're able to engage, yes. you're yes. wonderful. Um, love to get your five minute um, statement uh, and uh, then we will proceed through. 
Very good. Very Absolutely. Generous. Yes, thank you. It's an honor to be here um, and listening to Henrietta's words. I couldn't agree more. Uh, it's a great framing. And what I'm going to focus on is our, our policy brief, which is a very concrete, specific one, right? And it's done together with um, scholars and advocates and think tankers from uh, the US, Germany, UK, uh, uh, Costa Rica, and uh, uh, Uruguay. Um, and it comes from the recognition that poverty is very concentrated in children. Um, and that is a serious concern, not just for the humanitarian aspects, but for the future development of the next generation. Um, and also from the more positive knowledge that intervening in early childhood and during these uh, childhood years can really prevent a lot of the negative effects that poverty and especially malnutrition uh, can cause. Um, and, and so there's basically an opportunity for a lot of bang for the buck. Then in the context of, if we look at the fertility transitions, the thing is most babies are today born in low income countries in the global south, that trend will continue and maybe even be exacerbated over double, double the uh, children are born in uh, lower income countries compared to middle income and higher income countries. Um, and so given this, we make a very specific uh, call for a universal global uh, basic income for all the world's children at the World Bank extreme poverty level of uh, $1.2 dollars a day. Um, and, and to fund this, it should be unconditional, uh, not just because conditionality can be demeaning, but because we don't have the resources to monitor or even to offer the sort of supply side services necessarily, but just to uh, basically have this kind of as a, as a universal entitlement um, and that it should be funded from a global fund. Uh, the lower income countries themselves cannot afford it, uh, also because they have such a young population. And that would cost, we estimated 1.6% of global GDP, which is um, a pretty significant amount, but um, it could uh, be collected through different mechanisms of global taxation. And also if it were done, it would basically um, save a lot of costs uh, in the future. So that's our very specific um, policy proposal. We talk about the other potential effects and how to get there, but I think I'll leave it at that so we can have an interactive discussion. Thanks so much, Marike. Um, that was uh, uh, admirably to the point and it will stick in the back of our minds um, that uh, Poverty is concentrated in children and poverty is concentrated in low income countries uh, and a global fund uh, for the alleviation of poverty um, would be uh, for children um, would uh, be required. Could I turn to you, um, Lea Marie, uh, and give you a five minute presentation and then we will put all the building blocks together. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak today with all of you here at the Think7 Summit. Uh, my name is Leah Lübel and I work for the International Labour Organization. And I thank uh, the three other panelists for their proposals and I think how you will follow up with the third one. But let me tell you that these kind of proposals in relation to social protection worldwide are all proposals or at least calls for that we hear at the International Labour Organization in our daily business. We are the custodian of actually observing labor markets and the social protection worldwide. Uh, and this is SDG 1.3. So there's actually already a global commitment on providing social protection on a global scale. But the need to accelerate it now is now and why that is the case, I want to deliberate on also on how we can actually improve social protection worldwide. And what the ILO and the UN system are calling for currently is an accelerator for jobs and social protection, interlinking employment policies and social protection policies. Let me start with that social protection worldwide is still not uh, provided to everyone. Less than half of the world population have access to at least one form of social protection. And this is the case because in many countries, people work informally. They don't have the capacity to actually 
provide funding for national systems. And this is a very big problem in having stable social protection systems at a global scale. And COVID-19 has actually made things worse because due to COVID, working hours were lost throughout the world and people have even less work and even less income than before. And that even makes these systems more vulnerable. At the same time, though, we have seen that social protection systems could actually support economies to come back from the shocks that were happening during COVID-19. And I want to emphasize that during COVID-19, we saw a lot of ILO member states actually for the first time provide social protection to some of uh, the population that didn't have access before. And it's this kind of structures that were created that can now be actually used to scale up social protection worldwide. But for that, we also need jobs and jobs that actually deliver into these social protection systems next to the global fund that was already mentioned before and that might come uh, on the discussion point again later. We need jobs and we need to actually support people to formalize and to actually also look for where the jobs of the future are. And what we see is that due to the climate change, we see a shift and a need for a shift in the way jobs are held in certain sectors and sectors will need to change. And this kind of transition will also need support for those that need to change jobs. And here again, social protection systems are very important. So therefore acting now before we actually start shifting jobs from one sector to the other, for instance, in the energy sector are paramount. And so in order to create these safety nets, uh, the uh, Secretary General of the UN has called for uh, a global call on an accelerator to jobs and social protection. And it's a three pillared call, a call for country level action. And here we need funding also from the global north and particularly the G7 as a driver to actually create a fund that could support member states. And then, of course, we need a high willing coalition to actually try and test new forms of social protection and the interlinkages with new employment policies on national level. And this is what the ILO currently tries to call for. And this is what we bring into the G7 um, uh, dialogues ourselves, but which I think seven uh, constituents can bring in as well. Thanks so much. Thank you very much indeed. Um... You can see how these different uh, pieces of the jigsaw should be fitting together in your mind. Um, we've started to, with Henrietta on universal basic services, among other things, and then we moved on to Marika on Global Fund for Children, and now we have an accelerator for jobs and social protection. Um, these are all converging into complementary areas. And now we would like to turn last, but certainly not least, um, to Hayo, um, who will give us his five minute presentation. Thank you so much, Dennis. Thank you. Yeah, it still works. Um, so pleasure being here. Uh, please allow me to start my five minutes with uh, sharing and reading to you the seven development ministers meeting communique, which they published three days ago because they met seven days ago here in Berlin. And uh, they just uh, released their, their communique, which they called Achieving the Sustainable Development Goals in Times of Multiple Crisis. And in 69 very good points, which I will not read, uh, among those is point number 41. And very interesting to us in our discussion because it forms the backbone and it demonstrates that apparently they have already understood to quite some extent what we are asking for. They say, we need to accelerate progress towards universal, adequate, adaptive, shock responsive and inclusive social protection for all by 2030 through robust national policies and measures and scaled up international cooperation. Uh, we should access to social protection uh, will be made available or could be made available to another one. as well uh, we welcome the UN Secretary General's initiative for a global 
accelerator for jobs and social protection and support the process towards its establishment. So, end of quote. So he's back. Yes, wonderful. Thank you. So that's already very promising. So some people already have listened. And this is not surprising because uh, the lack of so access to basic social protection services and benefits is not something that has only happened uh, since two years, since we look at the pandemic. It's a fact since decades. And uh, uh, that's pretty miserable, especially for those that do not have access to at least even not one social uh, uh, social protection benefit. And that, as Lena Elia said, is half of the world population. Now, 10 years ago, uh, all ILO members, they um, agreed and accepted a recommendation number 202 on social protection floors to establish social protection floors, which means basic access to social protection benefits to children, to elderly people, to people in active age, if they cannot create income for sickness, for maternity, for disability. And the fourth point, the fourth level is access to basic health services. So, and on a decent level, uh, according to national, national uh, needs. This recommendation, hasn't taken us very far. So we're still talking about 4 billion people not having access to even one of those four uh, services that I uh, just mentioned. So that is why uh, the former director of the Social Protection Department of the ILO, Michael Zichon, and I, we propose two simple things. One is we need a new convention uh, by the ILO or the UN to establish social protection floors as a conventional right, not a recommendation, but a right. Uh, so that right, that it's a right-based uh, right for, for people to, to really uh, deserve it, and uh, the ILO survey and uh, um, supervisory mechanism will take place. So a convention has a totally different uh, dimension and trajectory uh, than, than a recommendation. And the second one is that we, the international community should try and assist those countries that cannot afford to build or complete their social protection floors in doing so. Of course, we are talking about a lot of money. Uh, I don't know where I stand with five minutes, but I have two or three more sentences. The ILO calculated, and many others did as well, that 134 middle and low income countries will altogether need per year $2.5 trillion to close that social protection floor gap. That's a lot of money. But if you look at how many and how much of those 2.5 trillion uh, is absorbed by low income countries, it's only 4% of that amount. It's 90 billion per year. And now 90 billion, we have gotten used to large figures, 90 billion is ridiculous. 90 billion for one year and for 10 years in a row will close the social protection uh, floor gaps in all low income countries and will uh, change the lives of uh, so many millions, uh, just like the accelerator will as well uh, create for so many million people new jobs. So, and I think we'll have to discuss uh, what that means in terms of what can we afford, what should we afford. And let me uh, close by quoting the Finnish finance, uh, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, who a couple of weeks ago said when they were accumulating the money that the West should uh, mobilize to help Ukraine, he said, hey, we're only talking about money. Yes, we're only talking about money. It, it's just money that we need, nothing else. And that's not so difficult to find. And there are many, many uh, opportunities for us to, to collect these monies. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for this um, impassioned uh, view of social protection. I think um, one way to frame overall the arguments that we've heard is that on the one hand, we have the commonly espoused view that 
the world as a whole has more than an, has generates more than enough product in order to feed everyone, provide them with basic health services, basic education, um, the basic services that uh, Henrietta was talking about. And for somebody who came from another planet, they would find it mysterious that uh, we haven't done so. Um, and it would still leave uh, lots of income left over for people who are affluent. On the other hand, we have the world that we live in, which is divided into nation states. Um, nation states are primary source of identity, um, little interest uh, in helping other nation states um, quite often. And um, also within nation states, we know that inequality is rising within countries more quickly than it has been rising between countries for at least the past 20 years. Um, so there is this rise in inequality together with an understanding that we should, we are fully capable of giving people the basics um, of life. And here, in this group here, we've developed, we've articulated a proposal that um, this first view that give people the basics of life, um, that uh, should, should win. And now the question is, how can that be made to happen, not only within the G7, that seems like uh, relatively, uh, the relatively easier option, but for the world as a whole, um, beyond G20 and beyond. And each of you has framed your, um, your advice in those broader terms. So before we actually interact on this, I'd like to take a first round of questions from the audience uh, that um, reflects on what would have to happen to welfare systems in order to enable this. How can a new formulation of human rights be met with a new formulation of human obligations uh, that would enable those rights to be met and so forth. Are there any questions from the floor to give us some, an initial response to what has been asked? demanded here. Yes, please. And if you'd identify, walk up to the microphone, identify who you are, and keep thank, your thank question you short, and that will be the beginning of an interaction. We will do. So I'm um, Robert Yates from Chatham House in, in, in London. Um, one, um, I suppose, social protection mechanism that, that does seem to have amazing traction and, and buy-in at, at the highest political levels concerns universal health coverage. Well, one can very much sort of say that the whole global health agenda has been driven by this. It's um, an SDG target in its own right. There's a whole UN General Assembly resolution um, about it as well. And the, uh, the, the whole COVID situation has made the case for literally everyone having the health services they need with financial protection, just blindingly obvious. I mean, no one's suggesting that people buy vaccines over the counter. Now, the, the G7, six of the seven G7 nations, I would suggest, have got pretty close to universal health coverage. The noticeable exception, of course, being the United States, which hasn't yet, but hopefully will do one day. And I suppose just thinking in terms of us being able to demonstrate to the world that it is perfectly feasible to have truly universal social protection mechanisms, for the G7 to almost double down on universal health coverage and use that as a way of sort of proof of concept that this can be done at all income levels. I mean, you know, it, it's been achieved in a lot of our countries in, in, in the post-Second World War period, uh, but you have countries like Rwanda doing a pretty damn good job at introducing a, a universal health system after the genocide, and they've got very high vaccination rates now. So um, this is a sort of suggestion, really, that rather than a sort of try and attack all seven at the same time, and that is going to be a bit of a push, to be able to really double down for the G7 to sort of seal the deal on universal health coverage might be a good strategy. Uh, G7 is, uh, Germany is very strong on universal health coverage, Japan especially so, I would say, that this could be a very good strategy for us to employ. 
Thank you very much indeed. That was some an interesting question and it would be um, useful for our first round to consider it. Um, uh, Henrietta, um, clearly uh, health is uh, within your portfolio, but you suggested that we start with transport and digital services to start out with. Could you give us um, your background reasoning, um, argue, well, each of us will need to argue for and against uh, making universal health coverage our first priority. Henrietta. Well, I think what's important here is understanding the, the intersecting nature of the transformation that we're facing. So, for example, one of the big problems with health coverage all across the world is not the health service itself, it's the access to it. And access is very often a transport problem. You've got to get there. Some people are still walking toward, towards their health care, for example. So I think we have to think about how these things inter intersect. Now, modern forms of health care, so the idea that you would you know, send a doctor out to see someone or a doctor or a nurse or out to see people, these things are being rapidly replaced by digital services and the digitized, digital nature of new kinds of health, health service technology. In fact, Rwanda itself has, has managed to make progress in precisely that area. So here we have to see how these things have to move together, particularly because if you don't do that, you risk create, creating new pockets of exclusion, which then become very, very costly to address. So in the interest of time, I'm going to stop there, I think. Thank you very much indeed. That was um, powerful to, and exactly to the point. Um, would uh, either of uh, the rest of you like to respond? Um, Hayo. Thank you for the question. I, I will not respond to it. <laughs> um, it I wanted to, to respond to actually your point of, you mentioned Rwanda. Of course, Rwanda is achieving a lot already, but funny enough, Rwanda is also among those 10 countries, basically African countries, the only non-African is Haiti, that would have to spend more than 10% of its GDP in order to close its social protection floor gap. And we, uh, when we calculate, you know, what is possible for a country to achieve out of its own means or its mobilization of new forms of tax collection or increasing ODA or whatsoever, uh, and illicit fun, uh, financial flows. And uh, uh, we consider 10% is impossible. Yeah, There are others like Mozambique, they would have to contribute more than 40%. So, but Rwanda is one of those 10. Uh, before coming to Geneva, I worked six years in Costa Rica. Just last example, please. Uh, Costa Rica is not considered to be the most terrible places on earth. They have started their whole social protection system basically 100 years ago. If you look at Costa Rica today, the degree of liberty and of maneuver for the government to dispose of what you look at, what their budget is, annual budget, and if you deduct whatever they have to pay for by constitution, they remain with 5%. Okay, I 5%. would like to interrupt at this point. You can tell for the them simple listen, reason you know, that we'd like to return to the subject matter at hand, which was universal health services. And in the future, it would be good um, for us to introduce these things in a way that is conducive to uh, a true interaction. Um, Leah, would you like to address the issue of universal health services? Yes. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, first of all, um, let's recall that uh, universal health care is part of the so-called social protection floor that was mentioned over and over again today already, in that it is one of four essential services that has been part of a recommendation that was actually declared by the ILO member states 10 years ago. Whether this is actually the priority in the end is a matter of national uh, prioritization, and it has become a priority due to COVID, and we see that in the response of member states in asking the WHO, but also the ILO, to support in creating systems on national level to um, basically provide healthcare services and financial access uh, to pay these services. But in the end, it's actually a national decision to advance, for instance, health services over an unemployment benefit. So these are, in the end, national priorities to take into consideration. 
And I think this is a really important point. Um, what is national and what should be considered transnational here? On the one hand, I think all panelists here agreed that some provision of universal basic services should be considered uh, of transnational importance. And the G7, the G20 and beyond uh, should have a role to play. But now with regard to universal health services, um, you've made the point that that should be an exception to that general rule. It should be national rather than transnational. Oh, Am no, I no. wrong? That, okay. that wasn't my saying. Okay, uh, good. No, because <laughs> no. Uh, healthcare, of course, transcends borders. And we have seen with COVID-19 how the fragility of one country actually leads to the fragility of many countries. So it is a global public good to be healthy. Uh, together with all the other kinds of social protection services that we might be talking about today. What I want to say is that implementation in the end is national. And there we see very much different prioritizations according to the different member states of the ILO. So it is one thing that the G7 can push uh, in for us, such as the ILO, to discuss a new um, social protection norm that would be binding once it is translated into national law. But it is another thing whether other member states follow. So I think the G27 forum is a good push and it, it's a necessary push. And we have seen that now with the development uh, cooperation track. And we will see so with the labor uh, ministry track that's taking place this week. Uh, but implementation in the end looks different. And I think um, G7 certainly has moral suasion, can lead by example. and. Uh, implementation always lies somewhere else. Merike, you have a particular angle with regard to children. Um, children should children's health be prioritized over other children's needs? What, how would you argue? Well, I would actually argue, and I really like, well, feed it off of Robert Yates's point. I don't think it's an either or because it depends on how you conceive of healthcare. And in fact, I would say, that focusing like the child transfers we're thinking of it because it's also a very strong health and well-being issue because child and malnutrition um, that's that's a healthcare problem trauma from childhood violence which is and why poverty is the high risk factor for violence these are all healthcare issues and so I, I think in fact they go hand in hand and also if you want to think of um, cheaper ways uh, to healthcare coverage with vaccines, as uh, Robert Yates mentioned, has been um, uh, pretty achievable. But then, when you look at it, it's very much a continuum. What do you consider as a package of universal healthcare services? Uh, and that can get extremely expensive, as we also have the same issue in developed countries. And so, preventive healthcare tends to almost always be cheaper than curative healthcare. So in fact, if you have child, like these cash transfers to children to prevent malnutrition, it saves a ton in terms um, of healthcare down the road, okay? And so I don't see it as an either or issue at all. I in fact see very importantly as part of a more holistic discussion of healthcare. And this is, I think, a more general point that you've now introduced into the discussion of healthcare, which is how to frame the question um, it becomes really important. If we frame the question around the treatment of disease, we'll have a very different focus than if we frame the question around yeah. healthy lives, which is yes. what uh, Germany's uh, G seven um, document uh, is about. And that drives you far more in the direction of prevention rather than treatment um, and so forth. Just wanted to highlight this aspect. We have uh, another question from the floor. Please um, identify yourself. I'm Meilin Fang from the chairman of the People-Centered Internet from the US, but originally from Singapore. I, um, I wonder about the framing of, of social cohesion as a cost might actually do us some detriment. Um, it's a transnational issue, and we have actually seen the leadership of digital tax as a transnational issue addressed. And so I 
I ask the panelists whether or not there's a benefit for us to actually consider social cohesion as an investment, just like government is an investment. We pay taxes so that we have protections. Perhaps this might be the first transnational investment that we all come and make together. You know, that is uh, another very important um, question that's been asked. How does the panel see social protection as an investment? Um, as an economist, I can say investment is that which has a rate of return. Um, this rate of return, uh, net of costs, um, can be considered vis-a-vis -vis other rates of return. The only thing that I'd like to add here to start the discussion is that the return should not merely be measured in terms of economic return, but also in terms of other measures of well being, like uh, the ability to be embedded within social groups that you value, the um, empowerment that you feel. Uh, the uh, transformative capability you have in making this a sustainable planet and so on. So widely considered, um, how would you see your proposals uh, in terms of uh, social protection as an investment? Um, let's uh, start the other way. Marike, can we start with you? Well, I think when you're talking about children, it's a pretty easy case <laughs> because we all, you know, we have so much empirical evidence that shows that every dollar invested uh, early on in childhood reaps multiple dollars in benefits and, and sort of reduced health care problems, uh, juvenile delinquency problems, unemployment problems, et cetera, et cetera. So I think when it comes to children, in fact, that discourse is used a lot, the social investment discourse. Uh, I think the bigger challenge is, you know, that we also, for very clear humanitarian reasons and human dignity reasons, don't want to have that kind of an approach for every single human being who needs social protections. And then, of course, using it more broadly than simply as an economic analysis of just sort of human dignity in and of itself being a return right then it becomes important but i think i think for the proposal we make it's kind of it's kind of part and parcel actually of the proposal i think that's a really important point um, that you make that uh, on the one hand if we're just considering human dignity and every human is endowed with dignity um, then the fact that this uh, requires some transnational redistribution should not weigh on us um, because there is a moral imperative. On the other hand, uh, the real politic um, of it all means that uh, people are much more sensitive to the plight of their own countrymen than they are of people abroad. And so the question of can this be considered an investment um, within each country uh, also becomes at least of political importance. So if we can keep both of these things in mind, the values aspect and the interests aspect, um, that would be really important. Um, can I turn to you, Ayo? Thank you, Dennis. Um, I think this perception of investment that spending on social protection systems, procedures, is actually an investment not in only human capital, but also in society, but also in the economy, is at the backbone of what we are proposing. And there is evidence for that, because just last year, the ITUC, the International Trade Union Confederation, they, they came up with a study where they actually calculated on the basis of 10 countries to what degree, and now in economic and percentage points, does investment in social protection systems in those particular countries translate into GDP, and that means growth. Because although we are all in the same boat, and we do not want to argue in numbers and figures and millions and trillions, the critiques that oppose our approach and system that, yes, we have said it costs money, but only money, their critique is that this is, you know, spent. It goes down the drain, you know, we have to work for it, we give it up and, uh, you know, so we have to argue as well with solid equations 
figures, models on top of our moral and ethical uh, convictions. So that is, that is my conviction. And that's a really important point. Um, there are ways of spending money on social protection that will not lead to a net increase in GDP. And there are other ways that will empower people and generate um, a lot more um, productivity and uh, social interaction. So lots of the devil here is in the detail. And I think um, that is a particularly important point. Um, let me turn to you, Leia. How yeah. do you see the issue of uh, so? social protection and social cohesion is an investment. No, I couldn't agree more on that one, definitely. It's an investment in people, it's an investment in economies, and it's an investment in our future as we need to transition in many parts of the economy and people will need to rely on a backup if they need to transition. And that's very theoretical, but it is already taking place in Germany, in the coal industry. Certain parts of the economy will have to shift in order for us to make our planet sustainable, and that needs sustainable backing. But at the same time, I want to come back to the UN proposal on, on jobs and social protection, and actually not thinking social protection in a silo, is that it is one thing that the, the global state community, they, they all pull together and create a global fund, and uh, provides cash transfers. But at some point, the system, the systems, the national systems need to be actually sustainable on them, their own. So we should not forget that it is one thing to invest globally, but it's another thing to actually support the member states in creating systems that can last. And that means also figuring out with them how their employment uh, uh, policies can be strengthened, how people can move from the informal to the informal uh, to the formal economy, can access um, financing for innovation, for new kinds of services, to get access to the global markets, to participate in a wider global um, yeah, community, to, to actually create prosperity and then to contribute to the systems that once backed them. So I think this is why the UN would actually call for for investment in social protection top down, but at the same time, thinking in systems and national structures that can actually hold these systems for a long time. Thanks, that's another terribly important point. These social protections are embodied in vastly different welfare states. Whether you look at each of the G7 countries, um, be it uh, Japan and Germany and Italy, completely different welfare states. Uh, how just to have a global fund that uh, pours money into these different welfare states will have vastly different implications for what will happen. And therefore getting into the nitty gritty of how this money is to be spent in terms of things that give people incentives, extrinsic and intrinsic incentives, to become productive agents within their societies and economies is something that you, Henrietta, have given a lot of thought to. Therefore, I'm delighted to turn this um, part of the conversation over to you, seeing universal basic services um, as an investment. Well, thank you. I mean, great, great questions to this afternoon, uh, all of them. But I think, first of all, we have to see this as an investment. Seeing it as a, as a cost and then looking for rates of return is very likely to end up in the kind of um, sterile sort of conversation that Hayo points out happens so often when you raise these things. I think we, 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 we need to think about the fact that the fact we have different welfare systems, even within the G7, for example, is actually a strength because it means we can experiment in those different contexts and see what works best under different conditions. So we're not trying to provide a one answer to a complex problem, but we are trying to, I think, to shift the understanding of what drives economic thinking at the present time, because we've been living for a very long time in the under a sort of governing ideology that says if we will ha if we have economic growth we will have social well-being and we've suddenly come to a full stop a very nasty full stop where we realize that actually we haven't got social well-being out of the economic growth we've had 
uh, if anything, we are at the moment experiencing social fissiperiousness on a scale which we can hardly cope with. And this brings in the question of the digital again, which we haven't talked about yet, but which we do need to talk about. I think what I would say from the work that I do is that it's important to begin from a, a different way of thinking, which is to say that social value drives economic value. So if you look after your children, you will have future economic productivity. If you fail to do so, you will not. And then we have to say, you know, what is the purpose, for example, of regenerating the planet that we have? Is the purpose of regenerating the planet simply so that we can increase GDP further? That's not the sole purpose of increasing the planet. So I think understanding the value proposition, as you said earlier, Dennis, with the mechanisms that are going to be necessary to deliver outcomes in specific contexts is precisely the challenge we face. And this is where the G7 has to provide leadership, not one answer for the entire world. We're not asking that, right? We're asking for some leadership. Thanks very much. Um, that uh, really frames it uh, in a very powerful way. And uh, just keep in mind uh, one important quote here that social value drives economic value, um, not the other way around. Um, that is uh, very closely related um, to our theme of recoupling. Um, I would, uh, before we take uh, the next question, I'd like to uh, respond to your admonition that we do not neglect the digital domain. Let me just um, introduce uh, a quick round uh, in our discussion. We live in a digital world where for the first time in human history, we do not have control over our own social networks. They come prefabricated to us by LinkedIn, Facebook, and so on. Many young people, adolescents, are tied into competitiveness uh, on the likes and followers that creates lots of anxiety. Um, a competitive system that they did not choose, but was foisted upon them by the digital service providers. We live in a world where in the digital age, the market economy is being undermined because we receive free digital services and provide free information about ourselves, form of digital barter that is financed by third parties that want to influence us economically or politically, um, and that creates huge inequalities uh, and gives rise to large, important social problems uh, as um, uh, the, the social silos in which we live uh, makes uh, decision-making in democracies much more difficult. So the question that I'd like to ask the crowd is, given this new digital world that undermines many of these capabilities and capacities that Henrietta has been talking about, what can be done um, in order to rectify the rules of the game and bring it within the spirit of these universal social protections um, that we have been talking about? Um, if I could uh, now um, start with you again, Henrietta, since you were the one who admonished us. Um, what role does the digital domain play within these um, universal protections? And how do you believe it should be protected? Well, thank you, Dennis. It's, that's a very difficult question. Let me just try to answer one part of it as a way of getting the discussion going. I think that one of the things that we have been experimenting with in the Institute is partnering with local authorities where we have used the digital access to the digital to deliver um, public services and public goods to populations in a different way and do so in a way which allows them to participate in the decision making around how those things are being done. So it isn't just a matter of delivering whatever it is to people but allowing them to be um, part of, if you like, the creation of a a digital domain, that is a digital platform 
which encourages not just um, social innovation, but also economic innovation on the back of that social innovation. So here we're looking at how new jobs are going to be created, but also new possibilities for new forms of delivery, new uh, forms of governance, new forms of participation. And I think seeing it in the round helps very much as opposed to just imagining it as a kind of very large speaking tube. Terribly important um, point. Uh, if we can just uh, keep in mind uh, that the way forward may simply be empowering digital citizenship uh, and uh, giving citizens control over their lives, um, much as they have control in their offline world of um, their labor services, um, provided they have sufficient capacities in terms of health and other universal basic services to do so. Um, Marike, could I turn to you? How would you say we should protect against the manipulation, exploitation of psychological weaknesses, inequalities, and so on that have arisen in the digital domain, especially with regard to the children that you're concerned with? Well, let me say that as sort of the a provider end and regulations and power is not something that and I'm an expert on. In fact, I thought the policy brief that you guys wrote was excellent and really interesting. And I'd like to think about that more. Let me just say that digital manipulation does presuppose digital access. And that's still a very important concern in lot, some, especially some parts of the world where, for example, just access to cash transfers, you have to, you know, often that can be digital um, and people who don't have access to um, internet and mobile phone apps, et cetera, uh, are excluded from it. And that goes to transfers, to services, to education, online education during the COVID years when schooling went online. So I, 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 I would just throw in there how important it is to think of access, digital access as a universal human right. And beyond that, I can, couldn't agree more that it's absolutely vital to get it regulated, especially as children. Um, my own kids <laughs> spend way too much time on the screen. So, I, um, so I'll leave it at that. That's my main concern from the point of view of what I'm looking at is actually having access. So I think both of those points that you've made need to be seen in relation to one another. Um, if we just look at digital access, and don't look at uh, a reform of the digital governance system, then we are in this paradoxical position where we say, in the United States, there's lots of evidence that um, teenage suicides, depression, um, mental health problems, eating problems have all been um, high, cl very closely correlated with their digital access. And if all you're saying is, yes, please, let's have more of it, um, that sounds like not quite the right framing. So putting the digital access together with the reformed digital system would be really important. Um, Leo. Absolutely, yeah. What do you have to say in this regard from the ILO perspective? Yeah, I, I think I can only uh, agree with Marike that I'm not an expert in, in actually regulating uh, the digital uh, market and how we actually use digitalization, but the microphone might be off. I'm not sure. Um, ah, now it works. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to say that I agree with Marika that I can only actually comment on access and not necessarily on the regulation and the use of data once we actually use platforms. But from an ILO perspective, the use of digitalization was paramount, particularly during COVID and now even during the Ukraine crisis. Actually, it is a very good way to disperse regularly social protection. And we have expanded, uh, with help of the German government, by the way, in several countries, social protection in the garment sector. And that has mainly been done via mobile phones and uh, where the use of uh, services that were digitally available. And uh, also what we see now in the Ukrainian crisis is that the Ukrainian government over the last years has actually digitalized many of its administrative services to its citizen, and they can they are stable throughout even the war now going on. Um, and that is very helpful in supporting people who have lost their income, for instance, right now. So access is important, but I can see your point that 
the use uh, of data might be tricky because it is actually financialized by other institutions and people don't have a say in what's happening to their data. Right, good. Very important point. Um, Hayo, join in. Um, I join Leah. Uh, I don't even have two cents, but only one to offer. Uh, I fully agree it's access and it's uh, at the same time regulation. Um, and But you mentioned, Dennis, empowering digital citizenship. I, I fully agree. But let's not forget there is also empowering non-digital real citizenship. Because, you know, in many countries around this globe, we don't, we do not only have this digital citizenship empowerment problem, but in, in many, 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 we have a very real citizenship empowerment uh, problem. And that actually closes the circle to what uh, Leah uh, introduced earlier on this afternoon. Um, in the end, it is one country's A and B and C's decision what social protection services to offer to its population. It's not our task to define that. It's not the UN's. We can suggest something. Listen, it worked in this country. It would be great for your population and everybody to offer that. But in the end, it's them. So basically, that means their governments, and in a positive way of looking at it, their populations. But very often now, we are lacking this participation, pluralism, inclusion nexus between population and population's will of the citizenship and the government's will. So, you know, there is so much behind this whole uh, 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 merry-go-round that we are looking at that we know something is definitely needed, but it has to come from the country itself as well. So what I wanted to chip in on, lay on the table, is empowerment of the population and citizenship of those countries that we want to help. I say help, yeah, in quotation marks. Real digital, uh, real citizenship empowerment. Thanks. That is a really important um, issue. Um, participatory democracy and digital citizenship seen within that broader framework. Um, I believe um, it should be clear to everyone uh, in this room, um, and particularly uh, clear to myself, because together with Paul Toomey, I'm, uh, we've uh, put together a large uh, working international working group on uh, digital governance reform, that it is possible to empower citizens in the digital realm give them control over the data about themselves, both individually and collectively. Um, that means creating lots of data commons, just like we have lots of associations, um, uh, financial, sports associations, and so on. That too could be done in the digital realm with people organizing these, having a fiduciary duty to use the shared data only for the purpose um, that these people have given it. Um, in the offline world, it is totally impossible for a doctor to sell your health data to a pharma um, company. Uh, in the online world, uh, you can your data can be sold to others um, without your knowledge for all sorts of purposes. So to make the online world more than offline is certainly possible. Now we have room for one final question, and that's from you. If you could come and identify yourself and give it give us our final round. Yeah, thanks, Peter Taylor from the Institute of Development Studies in the UK. Um, this last question perhaps bridges some of the conversations to, to date. Uh, I really am happy to hear about the idea of social assistance as a right. I'm really happy to hear you talking about the importance of adaptive and reactive systems. Uh, we've also heard a, you know, a lot of the conversation has been around citizens and populations. Um, currently, I think it's estimated there's around 400 million migrant, uh, international migrants uh, in the world. Probably that's a gross underestimate. Within countries, there are very many people who are internally migrating, some of whom are forcibly displaced. We also know that, that many countries have very inadequate civil registration and vital statistics uh, systems. So if social assistance 
Um, it's partly about the money. I think it's also about the systems, uh, as we've heard. And we heard this morning, Anna Katerina talked about systemic change. So as well as this galvanization to try to ensure the revenue is there, to understand that that's, a, that's an investment that's worth making, how do we approach supporting the emergence of systems at national level when the basic building blocks of many of those are very weak and many people just fall outside those systems, including in G7 countries where we have many people who are located within our borders but are not within the system and therefore even then would not have access to social assistance. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was a really important um, point that was made. And uh, previously, um, you made the important point that among the G7, the United States does not provide universal um, health coverage. There are over 30 million people in the United States without access um, to adequate health care. Um, the question, therefore, becomes not only uh, how can this be done, but what is it that we can do to make the voting populations willing to support the systems that provide dignity for all? Now, if we could have one final round on this with each of you restricting yourself to a maximum of one and a half minutes, um, we will uh, end on time. Um, Marika, can I start with you? Sure, uh, excellent point. So there's one that's sort of more practical and one that's more about the political coalitions to include immigrants, basically. On the practical issue and the vital statistics one. So over the last two years in, in my own research, which has involved like 27 countries in the global South, it's very interesting. Well, basically the social protection attempts of governments to reach people uh, to help them alleviate sort of the economic effects of the COVID crisis. The, the governments that instituted demand-driven mechanisms where individuals could self-identify and apply for aid, they actually significantly enhanced their databases. Like for example, even in Argentina and Brazil, higher middle-income countries, the government officials said, oh, whoops, we didn't know we had so many people in our borders. Um, and, I, and so there's actually some improvement there because of this, so it's kind of endogenously. When we argue for a global fund, we say that implementation should be through national agencies. And in fact, such a global fund for children would help improve national agencies' state capacity uh, by reaching every single child. Very much in principle, I would not restrict for sure. I mean, if, if, if a cash transfer is a child's right, it doesn't matter what citizen they are. Then there's the more politically difficult issue of convincing uh, domestic populations to include immigrants um, in social safety networks um, and public opinion shows that they're much less likely to do so. Um, and that requires broader political strategies. I'll stop now. It's one and a half minutes. Thanks very much indeed. Um, really important point of um, how to reconcile the transnational with the national. Leia, can I turn to you? Yes, uh, maybe to the institution building, that's what the ILO does. But the ILO is a very big tank with 187 member states plus the same amount of social partners. And before they come to agreement, it takes a lot of time. And this is why the G7 and the G20 fora are so important because it means there are a couple of countries who want to push the agenda forward and they actually push that within an organization like the ILO. And in the ILO, we have the social flagship, the flagship program on social protection floors, and we have a facility that supports member states in creating lasting structures that can provide different kinds of social protection services. But of course, this needs funding from the global community. And this is why the global accelerator for jobs and social protection is so important. We need on the one hand, a global alliance of member states that wants to fund an increase in social protection programs on national level. And this is what we can do. I agree, though, that migrants should be part of such access um, discussions. And even in Germany, this is not a given. So uh, I think that's actually uh, a program that uh, we need to talk to with all member states and not just with the lower middle income countries. Thanks very much. This institutional background. Hi, all. Thank you so much. Yes, indeed, systemic change we need. Uh, but in order for us to see something really changing within, let's say, a decade, I fully agree with you that we need some few champions to spearhead a process. 
and even if it would be on a laboratory pilot basis, but with substance, and to go along, and I'm not only thinking of northern and western countries, we also need countries from the global south that want to spearhead a new process together with us. And what we need is we need a global alliance for social protection. And the acronym I figured out this morning is GASP. The world gasps for, you know, I don't have to go into detail. So uh, thank you so much. Thanks, that's very powerful. Um, one of the most powerful acronym I've heard for a while, Global Alliance for Social Protection. Um, Henrietta, um, I'll give you um, the last word on how to uh, provide an institutional framework um, to make uh, these dreams uh, become a reality and also to provide um, the incentives um, for the voting population to uh, follow these dreams. Um, if I talk to my American colleagues about social protections um, in Europe, they say, well, that's communism. Um, we are the land of the free. Um, how does one overcome these uh, uh, barriers to understanding social protection? Um, and um, the, word, the floor is yours, last word. Well, it's a very difficult one, but I think it, those who have often have a great disregard for those who have nothing, and I think this is a huge problem. Um, I, I think in the terms of what we're talking about here, we're not just talking about citizens, we're talking about residents, because we're talking about place-based approaches to these issues. And I think we need to bear in mind why so many people in the world move. They don't move just because they like moving. Um, and addressing this issue around climate mitigation and adaptation would make a big difference. Addressing issues around social protection in situ would make a big difference. Addressing healthcare issues would make a big difference. Um, addressing the universal basic services that we talk about in the Institute would make a huge difference. People mostly moving now because of pressure around um, food, land access, or livelihood issues very largely as well, of course, of conflict and all the others. So I think one of the problems in situ in the G7 countries is that so many of such a significant proportion of population in those countries feel themselves to be excluded and therefore they want to exclude others. And I think if we could move more towards what we've been calling an economy of belonging, we can shift the dial quite dramatically there because we, we do people do actually want to collaborate and care for others, but not under conditions where they feel themselves under huge pressure. That is um, a perfect last word. Um, to create an economy of belonging is precisely what we need. I hope you'll all join me in giving a solid round of applause for these spectacular panelists. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart.